The intent of this module is to broaden the scope of fire shelter training through a case study. It will be delivered through the story of shelter deployments on the Little Venus Fire as told by two Unaweep Fire Use crew members, Ryan Jordan and module leader Lathan Johnson. It will be told in two parts with one exercise. Part one will deal with the events leading up to the deployments. The facilitator will then lead you in a decision-making exercise. Part two will describe the actual deployments and the lessons learned. Refer to information provided in your student workbook as well as any appropriate references in the IRPG to make your decisions. On July 18, 2006, 10 individuals assigned to the Little Venus Fire on the Shoshone National Forest as part of a fire use module were entrapped and deployed fire shelters. No significant injuries were sustained, no personnel were hospitalized, and all personnel were safely evacuated from the fire. This incident is a significant event but differs from past deployments. The involved personnel were not actively engaged in the performance of an operational fire line assignment. They were en route to a camp location to debrief with the crew they were replacing. They would not have a fire line assignment until the next operational period. Unaweep has an excellent reputation for safety and professionalism. Partly because of this reputation, they rotate trainees into the module throughout the season. Lathan Johnson's crew consisted of four regular crew members, a detailed assistant module leader, one member detailed from the Boise Smoke Jumpers, two from the Crassel Hell Attack, and two detailed from the Shoshone National Forest. All crew members were well qualified, physically fit, and experienced firefighters. Issues facing the crew included communication and logistical problems. The National Weather Service had also issued a red flag warning for a passing cold front earlier that morning. Our assignment was to um, replace, there was already a fire use module at the heel of the fire, or up at Venus Cabin, which was eight miles into the wilderness area. And our assignment was to replace them because they'd been on the assignment for 13 days. So on day 14, they were gonna get out of there. Um, and basically it was gonna be a briefing. We got the main picture at the district office, and then it was supposed to be assignment, hike in eight miles, meet that module, and get more of a briefing, get more assignments assigned to us, and more details and then stay at the fire for two weeks. Okay. Um, and when we got there, the mules hadn't even had any of our equipment loaded on them. Um, this is around 1300. Um, I mean, the day started off late. We didn't, it was an hour and a half drive to get out to the trailhead. So things just started getting bumped back later and later. And so when we we're sitting at the trailhead, we started assisting the packer loading up the mules because we knew we had to kind of get on the trail, get into the, get in to the module that evening. Um, the fire behavior that you could see anything of was a little bit of smoke at was the head of the fire at the time and that was way up top high elevation and there was a hotshot crew and a type 2 crew up there. So what we did at that trailhead was introduce ourselves to the new joining two members from the district, um, talked about where we're from, our fire experience a little bit and just a just a brief brief idea of what what we're going to be doing. Communications you could tell we're already scratchy because we couldn't get in touch with the module that we were supposed to tie in with, which was eight miles up the canyon. We were able to hear the ICP at the trailhead and the crew that was up on top of the fire at the head. The other communication concern was trying to get the packers to have radios. Um, we knew that they were taking off in front of us and we gave them the radio and told them a little bit how to use it, but he had no interest in, in turning it on. He said, I'll turn it on if I need it. The Packers were local from the area. One was a middle-aged gentleman that's been contracting with that district for quite a while, and he had a helper who was a younger boy, about 14 years old, that was from that area also. About the 15, 20 minutes we're sitting there, the one thing that people brought up was how the, this nice walk into the wilderness in the morning, nice and cool and good part of the day, has now turned into two, three o'clock in the afternoon, the hottest part of the day. And that was the only thing really brought up other than the length of the hike without um, knowing what was been going on the last day or two in that draw. So when we left Jack Creek Trailhead, our anticipations were engaging in no fire activity. It was gonna be a casual walk in, eight miles to the Venus cabin, pretty relaxed, no Nomex. We weren't supposed to be seeing fire. Um, things were supposed to be a, a nice walk in the wilderness. About an hour and a half in, we started getting some communication with the Black Hills lookout 
And at this point, there was a little bit of radio traffic, still scratchy, not real clear, that there was fire on both sides of the draw, and they would recommend us to stage for a little while. And that was an event where we all stopped, got together, kind of heard what was going on, and at that point, we didn't feel any discomfort because we couldn't see anything that they were talking about, couldn't see the column. We had the mule train in front of us, so if we stopped, there was no way to get hold of them because they didn't have the radio on. We tried at that point, um, so we knew that we felt that we would go until we saw the fire because we still had a ways. We were only at mile two at this point when we were supposed to be going eight miles, so we couldn't really make sense of what was going on with that. And two, the mule train was in front of us and there was no way to get hold of them, so we thought we'd go try to contact them as well. So at that first stop when we heard Black Hills telling us about a little bit about the fire being on both sides of the draw, we should hold up. One of our module leaders, the one that was from the district working with our crew, knew where that module leader or that module unit was talking about. And so he told us that he knew the location where the fire was on both sides of the draw. He knew an alternate route that would get us around that area. He felt comfortable enough to keep walking in there. And so then we we proceeded on the trail up to the Anderson Creek Trailhead, or the Anderson Creek River Junction, and that's where he explained a little bit, that's the alternate route. If we need to go that way, we can. And at this time, we still didn't have a visual on the fire, so we decided to keep moving up the Gray Bull drainage. Um, and we, at this time, we hadn't tied into the mules. And so we continued about another 200 yards past, or about 400 yards past the Anderson, Anderson Creek Junction, and came up over a, a rise topography feature and that's when we encountered the first visual of the fire coming at us. This is when we knew we weren't going to be pro progressing any further. Everybody ch changed their mindset that this is a fire situation. We put our Nomex on, hard hats came out, um, you know, PPE became apparent that we needed it. Um, at this point, the fire use module advised some people to start turning around and heading back down the trail. We hadn't met up with the mule train yet, so we were actually trying to establish communication there, again with the radio. None of that was helping. We tried whistling a little bit. And what was confusing was we didn't know how they could be going that much further ahead of us because the fire was half a mile away from us. And so they, we knew they had to be in between us. Um, stood there for about five, ten minutes, knew that we had to get out of there. Um, right when we were starting to turn around, the younger boy with five mules came cruising out of the out of the timber, came by us. One of the members told him to keep continuing down Jack or the Gray Bull River and get to the Jack Creek tail, Trailhead. And at that time, most of the crew members had been reversed order. Our turnaround point, um, people started hiking down. So at the turnaround point, myself and two other of the module crew crew members. One of them was the leader. The other guy was the the local district guy. And we waited there for another minute to see if the older packer would be coming out and we didn't see him, we started going down because we knew we had no more time to waste. And I remember actually looking at my module leader saying, I don't think he's going to make it. And that's when we knew we had to start moving. The Unuit module is now at a critical decision point. What would you do? We all know the ultimate outcome was good. However, decisions had to be made and action had to be taken to ensure that outcome. Given the story thus far, visualize yourself as a member of the crew and consider some of the possible outcomes or what-ifs and the actions you would take for each. Get into your groups and discuss your assessment of the situation. Utilizing the map in your student workbook and the IRPG, determine a plan or plans of action for your what-ifs. Your facilitator will give you 15 minutes and will then randomly select someone from your group to communicate a plan of action in the form of instructions to your crew. There are no right or wrong answers. We are now at the point where the module has decided they cannot wait for the packer and must move down the trail. They are on the move for about two minutes when they hear the mules and the packer coming down the trail behind them. However, upon seeing the firefighters in the trail, the mules become startled and scatter into what is referred to as the rodeo. Firefighters spent five to ten valuable minutes gathering up the mules to get them moving down the trail. So at the turnaround point, the crew that had probably the crew members that had left before us were probably about fifty to hundred yards ahead of us when we actually started going back down the trail. So everybody was still fairly close, but 
everybody knew that we had to we had to be getting down the trail. We were progressing down the trail about two minutes down from our turnaround point. We started hearing whistling, yelling, bunch of bunch of mules coming down. So we knew the mule the mule train was coming. Um, we tried getting off the trail because we knew that's where they were at. As soon as the mules saw us standing on the trail, chaos broke out. Six mules scattered all our gear. The trail was only you know, five feet wide anyhow, long timber. We, we basically helped the Wrangler get all his mules in front of us and he started moving back down the trail. And after they started moving down the trail, at this point the fire was on us. Spots, fires all around us, you could feel the heat. And we, we, were, almost, we were all together, spread out maybe within 20 yards of each other. We started moving down the trail a little bit more, came across a couple packs that had been dropped. Um, and me, myself, and the module leader were, were in the back, and the member of the module leader picking up one of these packs, throwing it in the river, just thinking that, hey, this will save this pack. Might as well save a little bit of equipment if we can. Um, at this point, we crossed the river because the fire was on our right side, and the only cool place at this time was on the opposite side of the river. Module leader, everybody crossed the river. We all crossed the river, started running down to the Anderson Creek Junction because we knew that was our last place that we saw a viable option for. At that time, it was just briefly discussed, hey, that's a place we could come back to if we need to. Um, so everybody in their mind knew where we were going. Um, we got to that Anderson, Anderson Creek Junction. The fire was basically right on top of us. There was a little bit of discussion, should we run up Anderson Creek? Should we keep trying to run down the mule, the, the pack trail? Um, and at this point, the decision was made to deploy our shelters. At that deployment site, threw down the crosscut, took off my PG bag, and literally I said to myself, I can't believe this is happening. Never ever thought I'd be doing this, grabbing my shelter out of my pack. And I knew that you had to do it because at that point you couldn't go down river at this time, couldn't go up, up Anderson Creek. So you knew that you're relying on this little piece of equipment that you've been trained to use. You're sitting there going, I have to use it. And pulling those tabs was probably the weirdest thing to do it for, you know, for real, real life scenario. And grabbing the, I mean, and luckily for nine years I've been a fire. Every time, every season you go through some type of training, but you never realize, you don't think you're ever going to have to do it. So to actually pull that, that shelter out for reals was a, a different experience. And when I pulled that shelter out, tried to flake it out, I remember almost laughing to myself because you hear over and over how the wind's going to be blowing, things are going to be loud, things are going to be crazy. You know, when you do it out on a lawn in a spring summer day, it's nice and easy to do. But in that situation, the wind was 50, 60 miles per hour. I mean, enough just to be popping trees over all around you. The heat, the embers, the smoke. I mean, it was, with all those different environment factors, it was a lot more difficult than any training I've ever prepared for. And to hang on to the shelter, that's absolutely true when you hear about wind being being super strong and you need to hang on to your shelter because when you flake that out and you shake it, if you're facing with the wind, if you're hanging on to it, it's going to be gone. And so the fact that those things in the training, even though I didn't actually get those real case scenarios in training, they, they're in your head. So when you actually did do this, you were prepared for it. When we were deploying our shelters at that deployment site, mm -hmm. the, you know, the module leader counted nine heads and he said we're missing one we're missing one anybody know where Monica is and people looked around the last time we saw her was right at the rodeo um, we didn't see her crossing the river with us we didn't we didn't see her running to the Anderson Creek Junction with us so actually when we're deploying everybody thought that she probably either went out with the mule train r running with them or maybe at the worst case scenario got picked up by the Wrangler and thrown on a horse that was what we were hoping for um, after the initial pass of Grable, or the fire pass down Grable, we got out of our shelters and knew that we were going to have another push from Anderson Creek. Um, that's when we decided to light a backing fire to try to give a break from the fuels. But we also looked over at the Grable drainage, and there was no way we could use that area as a retreat zone because, for one, it was still, still very hot, tons of snags burning. The wind was still strong. You could hear snags falling left and right. Couldn't see much. The smoke 
was very thick. I mean, just being out of your shelters for those five minutes that re, we reorganized and regrouped, your eyes were watering, your breathing already had changed, and you knew you almost had to get, you almost wanted to get back in the shelter just to get a break from the smoke. Um, it was a really good deployment site as far as, um, to park, you know, it was flat, level, it was an old sandbar, um, it was a really good, really good deployment site. Two of, the other two of us came back from their backing fire, and at this time, the fire that had gone down Grable had crossed the creek and was starting to come up Anderson, while the spot fire up above Anderson Creek were actually starting to come together. So we knew that we were going to have an intense, intense push through there. And so that's when everybody got in their fire shelters, grouped together, and rode this one out. This push, this push was a lot different than the first push. This push, just in the shelter, was very uncomfortable. The heat, you're sweating like crazy. You had to be breathing through your Nomex, through the dirt. You had to hold the shelter down with all, all four corners. The wind was intense. When the shelter would touch your skin, you could feel the heat. So you'd have to kind of keep that air pocket. Um, you could hear the noise. You couldn't, it was, it was freight train coming through. I mean, it was the loudest I've ever heard fire. Didn't know it'd sound like that. You could hear the embers, pine cones, twigs, sticks hitting your shelter. I mean, it, I mean, you hear how you could try to prepare for this stuff, but to actually be in it, it's, it's all there. It's just like, holy cow, this is really happening. And um, it, was, it was definitely an experience. We got out for the last time, it was 17.30. So we were exa in there about right at an hour. Um, pulled the shelter out, kind of walked around, looked at things. Everybody else was still in their shelter, kind of started, hey, guys, are you okay? Come on out. Let's, and so we, people started popping out, knowing it was okay to come out. And the scene when you came out, it, it was, it was kind of mind-boggling because our gear that was left by our shelters that had no fuel around them, you know, nothing, no, no direct flame impingement were melt, was melted. Tool handles, the Pulaski tool handles had burnt. I mean, so right there you're going, holy cow, that's how much heat was coming off of that 60-foot stand of timber 20 yards from us. And you looked at some of the shelters and see some, you know, delamination and some burn marks, and you realize that if I didn't have that shelter right there at that time, you might not be here. So, and that was, that was kind of crazy because everybody comes out of that and um, you look around at your crew members and people have a different way they react to the situation. I mean, I came out and I was like, wow, you know, soaking it up, taking pictures and going, man, I made it through this. I go over to a buddy and ask him how he's doing and it's a different, different level. I mean, he's not talking, you know, you could tell he's upset and it's just like, hey, you know, he's like, all I could think about is my kids. Yeah. And so, so when you're there and I was happy to be in the situation, I kind of got brought down a little bit because you, you realize that people have different, different priorities in life. After we got out and heard Monica's voice on the radio and knew that she was okay, we actually did a little grid out to try to find where she was at. And she's only 120 yards upriver from us. So we got her and brought her to the, the, our deployment site. And you know, we, we, we sat against the rock wall that was kind of protecting us for about an hour, 45 minutes, an hour. First, deciding if everybody was um, comfortable enough to walk out of here, if we wanted to stay. We felt it was the best, best decision to get out of there that evening because we were just about out of water. Um, all our food and everything that we were supposed to have was on the mule train, which was at the trailhead, so we had no food. Water was pretty much gone. Um, so we wanted to get out of there, but the biggest concern was the snags. I mean, it was just a huge snag patch walking out. And at that point, we just um, we wanted to get out, so the safest way was just to almost do do a lookout system. I mean, we'd have one person, one person at a time, go 50 yard section, 100 yard section, stop, and we just have lookouts and have one person go at a time. And we just kind of kept leapfrogging as we went out until we cleared the snags. Um, and that worked well, I mean, because after being through an event like that, the worst case scenario would be getting taken down by a snag on your way out. That would have been horrible. So we were very cautious. People were 
physical condition was, everybody was, I mean, the smoke inhalation that you were exposed to was enormous. I mean, the lungs, just breathing, you felt like you were short of breath. The headache, the headache that I had, I've never had a headache that bad, and other crew members said they've never felt that, that painful of a headache either. Um, so everybody was just a little fatigued, mentally fatigued, physically fatigued, and so we just did everything we could to get out safely together as a crew and get to the Jack, Jack Creek Trailhead. Um, the way I look at a fire shelter now is that it's a life-saving tool. Before, I looked at it as it's something that I'm required to carry. I'm not going to ever use it. I don't plan on using it. Um, it's something that's just in my pack. And after that, sit that day and that situation, um, then when I went back to fight fire, the new shelter I put in my pack, I've never inspected a fire shelter so much as far as looking at it, making sure, oh geez, okay. And you had a different mindset on how this piece of equipment is going to affect your life. And, and if you didn't have that shelter in that situation that day, I wouldn't be here talking to you right now. I mean, if we stayed in that, that exact same situation, I wouldn't be here talking to you. Um, so in that regards, I'm a fan of it. I mean, it saved my life and something I'm always going to remember and make sure I have a good one, make sure it's properly inspected, make sure um, if anything ever happens to it, rip or tear, replace it, because if you have any type of defect in it, it could change the outcome of the situation you're put in. The Uniweep Fire Use Module received several commendations from the review team primarily for keeping their wits about them through the course of this event. Others included identifying a potential deployment zone during their hike up the canyon, having a high amount of concern for the packers and later their missing crew member. Commendations were also given for the method in which they deployed their shelters, placing ripped shelters in the middle of the rest to help deflect the heat away from the weaker shelters, and arranging everyone so their heads were pointing away from the heat source. Module members talked to each other to calm and support one another as well as to keep everyone in their shelters until it was safe to leave. In addition, they were able to continue safety awareness throughout their trek down the canyon throughout continuous hazardous snags. We asked Lathan Johnson to reflect on the things he'll take away from his experience on the Little Venus fire. You know, by no means I think every decision that we made that day at Little Venus was, was perfect, but we're making the best of decisions with the information we had um, and things change so quick. You know, I think there's a lot of things that, that play into your decision making in terms of experience, um, similar situations. Um, at Little Venus, um, one of the individuals who's with us had been through a 30-mile staff ride. Um, that actually came back to him during the deployment, was able to think about some of the things he had learned during that. So that's If you look back on the folks that are with us, not only you know, the folks of my crew, but the folks that were detailed in, you know, we all had a lot of experience. Everybody, when that fire was bearing down upon us, knew what they had to do, uh, knew we had to stay committed to the fire shelters, um, knew during that real hasty time we were able to get up, um, that we needed to reorganize, do some burning, those types of things. You know, there's a lot of different lessons learned that can be drawn from this. Um, some of the, the more important to me are, are communications, um, trying to make sure that they're adequate before you go into an area. Also, you know, trying to clarify in terms of, of what a fire is doing when you can't see it. Um, always being prepared for how fast the fire environment can change. Um, you know, you come around a corner, pop out on a hillside, and then you realize that you have a crown fire bearing down upon you. And how are you going to react to that? You know, from here on out, I'll probably look at every single situation in terms of what's the worst case thing that can happen right now and be prepared for that. Um, we hope the story of the Little Venus fire shelter deployments has helped you to appreciate the value of the fire shelters that you carry and the importance of the inspection and care of this life-saving piece of equipment. We ask that you carry this into the next phase of your annual fire shelter training and into this year's fire season. The transition into the new generation fire shelters for federal agencies should be complete by the end of 2008. For non-federal agencies, transition will be complete at the end of 2009. If you are carrying an old fire shelter, be sure that you are extra vigilant in the inspection and care of this vital piece of equipment. 
We would like to thank the members of the Unuweep Fire Use Module for sharing their experience with us to ensure that this will not become a lesson not learned. We would also like to thank you for your participation in this training and wish you a very safe and productive fire season.